Let's take our Bibles tonight and go to the book of Esther, chapter number one. The book of Esther, chapter number one. When you find your spot, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Esther, chapter one. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces, that in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even an hundred and fourscore days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace where were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance, according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his host that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also Vashti the queen made a feast for the woman in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abaktha, Zether and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, Admetha, Tarshish, Miris, Marcina, and Memukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law? because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. And Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes, when it shall be reported that king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mamukan. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own hosts, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that's before us this evening as we begin the study of the book of Esther. Lord, I just pray as we 
consider what's in this text and what's in this book, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you help us, Lord, to see that you're on every page, that you're there, Lord, that you are on the throne ruling over all. And I pray, Lord, that we'll realize that God is in control and yield ourselves to him. If there's someone here tonight that doesn't know the Lord as their Savior, I pray that one will be saved tonight. If there's someone here tonight that uh, just needs to dedicate themselves to him, I pray that they'll do that tonight. And I pray they'll use the time to make us more like thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> A young Jewish girl in the Warsaw ghetto managed to escape over the wall and hide in a cave. She died there shortly before the Allied army broke out the ghetto. But before she died, she had etched on the wall three things. First, she wrote, I believe in the sun, even though it is not shining. Second, she wrote, I believe in love even when feeling it or not. And the third thing she had written was, I believe in God, even when he is silent. I believe in God, even when he is silent. That's the story of Esther, isn't it? That's the story of Esther. In the book of Esther, God is strangely silent. In fact, there is no recorded message from the Lord. There is no record of men praying to him. In fact, in the entire book of Esther, God's name is not there. He is not mentioned. Now, that fact has upset some people. What's a book doing in the Bible that doesn't mention the name of God? Some people have been so upset that they've discredited the book and said it doesn't belong. I guess the Essenes, a sect in the New Testament day, uh, they were the ones that had the famous Dead Sea Scrolls, Apparently, they didn't contain a copy of Esther with their scrolls. They must not have thought that it belonged. Martin Luther thought that the book should be out of the Bible because it never mentions the name of God. And how could a book be in the Bible and not mention God's name? Is it a mistake? Is it an oversight? How does that happen? It's not a mistake. It's not an oversight. It's on purpose. God purposely left his name out of this book. And we'll look at that in just a minute, but just let me say this. It all fits into the message of the book of Esther. Because the message of the book of Esther is this. Even when God is silent, he's still there. He's still on the throne. You can believe in God even when he is silent. And so tonight I'd like to preach a message from Esther chapter 1 in the book of Esther entitled, God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. And as we begin, let's just get some introductory facts to the book of Esther. Maybe uh, just uh, some introductory facts, it will be okay with you. But um, uh, the historical setting of the book, it was believed to be written between 485 to 473 BC. No, sorry, that's when the story is supposed to have taken place. So 485 years before Christ. Uh, who wrote the book? It's believed that Ezra the priest wrote the book, but that's not anything known for certain. Really doesn't matter. It's God breathed. It's given by inspiration of God. The key word in the book of Esther is the word Jew. It appears eight times in singular form, 40 uh, Three times in plural form, a total of 51 times the Jews are referred to. And the key verse in the book of Esther is Esther 4.14, where it says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And then it says, and this is the key, And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther was brought to where she was by God's providence for such a time as this. And so that's the theme of the book of Esther, is the providence of God. God's providence, his providential care for his people. And just to give you a little bit more introduction about the history, when was this book written? Well, it's believed that this book was written at a significant time in history when Persia was wanting to defeat Greece. 
And, uh, and it's believed that King Ahasuerus' father had fought against Greece and lost in the Battle of Marathon. And then he came back and was trying to regroup, and he passed away. And his son, King Ahasuerus in our text, he's the real King Xerxes. Ahasuerus just means the king of Persia. So this is Xerxes as the king, and he's trying to go back and take Greece. And um, it's believed the feast that he's having in chapter 1 was, if, was also to prepare for that battle. And after chapter 1, he goes and fights the battle and burns Athens to the ground, but still loses. <laughs> and he comes back, and that's when he marries Esther. And uh, that's the time frame of the book. But from a biblical standpoint, the book of Esther takes place in the middle of the book of Esther, uh, of the book of Ezra. In Ezra chapter 1 to 6, we have the return to Jerusalem by a remnant group of Jews, led by Zerubbabel, a descendant of David. And then they rebuild the temple. And then a few years later, Ezra comes back in Ezra chapter 7 and restores worship. And so Esther takes place in the interim between Esther's chapter or Ezra chapter 6 and 7. And that really sets the scene for what the book is all about. It's about God's providential care for the Jews who were in Persia. These Jews, think of it. They, they had the opportunity to return. They had the chance to go back to the promised land. They had the opportunity to go and reclaim the inheritance that God had given to their fathers. But rather than going back, they were content to stay in Persia. They were content to stay in the enemy land. They were content to stay in the world. But rather than giving up on them, God still shows his care for them. He still provided for them, gave them his providence. And so that brings us to the, to the peculiar thing. But why is it? that in this wonderful book, 10 chapters long, why isn't God's name mentioned? Why isn't it there? And uh, it's noticeably absent. And let me say this, it, they definitely prayed, but prayer isn't in the book of Esther. We know in the Bible that fasting and prayer go together. This comes out neither, not by, except by prayer and fasting. They go together. When people fast, they pray. In Esther, they fast, but it doesn't say they prayed. It's not that they didn't pray, but it's purposely leaving out the Lord, leaving out the name of God. Why is that? Well, there's a couple theories. One theory is, well, these, these Jewish believers, this Jewish remnant, assuming they were believers still, they had the opportunity to go back to the promised land, but they didn't. They were content to live in the world. They were content with Persia as opposed with Jerusalem. And while God still had them as his people and providentially cared for them, they didn't have that relationship with him where he could put his name with them, didn't identify with them. You know, you kind of see that in Israel today. Israel is still God's people, but they don't have a relationship with him right now. They rejected his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you look through the history of the Jewish nation, there's been lots of Hamans, lots of ones that have tried to destroy them, and God still looks out for them. But they still don't have that relationship with him. They still don't have the name of God named among them. Also, though, it reminds us that Christians can be like that. Christians can be content to live in the world. Christians can be content with what the world has to offer as opposed to, as Hebrews has been calling us, pressing on. Instead of living by faith, they're content to live for the things of earth. And yeah, they're still saved. Heaven's still their home, but they're not the ones that God is not ashamed to be called their God. They're not the ones that God is pleased with because without faith, it is impossible to please him. So that's one theory is maybe it's because of their lack of relationship with God 
God's name isn't there. I believe there's something to that. A second explanation is this, and I believe there's something to this too. Why isn't God's name mentioned? Well, perhaps it's to show us, even in moments when it seems like God isn't there, even in moments when it seems dark and that God is far away, in circumstances where we think, no way that God is seeing this, God is still there. God is still on the throne. He's still ruling in the world of men. And that's the lesson of the book of Esther. It's a story of God's providence. There's no miracle recorded in Esther. There's no raising of, a blind, raising of the dead or opening the eyes of the blind or anything that draws any attention as being supernatural. Everything that happens is, you'd say, circumstantial. But as a Christian, you say it's providential because it's God's care in advance. As Matthew Henry writes, if the name of God is not there, his finger is. His finger is all over this book. And think of it. In the book of Esther, hope gets to the point where it's, an, it's at an all-time low. The enemy has the king at, at his, wrapped around his finger, and he's, del- he's come up with a plot to destroy the nation of Israel. It was an enemy that was far greater than any of them. But behind the scenes, God has already been at work and has the deliverance already prepared ahead of time. He hasn't forsaken them. He's already acting on their behalf. And just at the very moment when they need him most, they'll see that he is there. He's still on the throne. And so it is for us today. As Martin Luther wrote, in this world with devils filled, (laughs) that's the kind of world we live in. It's a godless society. We're living in a modern-day Persia. And yet, don't lose sight of the fact that God is still on the throne. He still meets the needs of his own. And so let's this evening just take a little bit of time to look at Esther chapter 1 and see once again that God is still on the throne. The first thing I'd like for you to see is in the first nine verses is that as we consider the book of Esther, we see that in spite of a godless monarch, a godless monarch, God is still on the throne. In these opening nine verses, we see a a man that uh, is king of Persia, Ahasuerus, but... uh, He's not a good man. You might read that and hear that and say, but he married Esther, and we really like Esther, so he must have been a good man. Uh, I hope Esther made him better than he was, but he was not a good man. History says that this man, Ahasuerus, is none other than Xerxes, the infamous king of Persia. As one commentator puts it, Ahasuerus is Xerxes. This is the king who ordered a bridge to be built over the Hell's Point and who on learning that the bridge had been destroyed by a tempest just after its completion was so blindly enraged that he commanded 300 strokes of the scourge to be inflicted on the sea and a pair of fetters to be thrown into it at the Hell's Point and then had the unhappy builders of the bridge beheaded. He had the sea beaten and beheaded the men that built the bridge. This is the king who drowned the humiliation of his inglorious defeat in such a plunge of sensuality that he publicly offered a prize for the invention of some new indulgence. That's a wicked man. This is the king who cut a canal through the Isthmus of Athos for his fleet. He's the infamous Xerxes. He's a godless monarch. He was a king who was so unpredictable that nobody was safe. A king that was uh, a a king that was on the throne of Persia. That would let's let Haman come and do whatever he wanted. And here in our text, we see him in all of his glory. In verse number one, we read how he reigned from India onto Ethiopia over 107 and 20 provinces. Interestingly enough, in Daniel's day, there was only 120 provinces. 
So since Daniel's day, the Persian Empire has grown. Now it is at its peak. Now it is at its strongest. Now is the time when it has its most glory. And this is the height of its existence. And so there Xerxes is in Shushan, the palace, sitting on the throne as if he is the ruler of all, as if he is the sovereign of the universe and able to do exactly what he pleases. He's living a godless life. He's throwing a feast in these verses. In verse number three, for all his princes and servants of his kingdom, the power of Persia and Media being before him. In verse four, he's showing off all his riches of, the, of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty. Many days, at 104 score days, six months, he's just showing off his kingdom. And now for that last week, he's making a big feast in the garden of the king's palace. I'm told, we're told in verse number six, how this garden was a beautiful garden. It had hanging baskets providing shade for them from the sun. And uh, there were white, green, and blue hangings with cords and fine linen and purple, the silver rings and pillars of marbles. The beds were of gold and of silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble. It was a beautiful garden where they were celebrating the glory of the king and the glory of the kingdom. And God isn't in any of their thoughts. They have no, no knowledge of God, no attention for God, no time for God. And they're living lawlessly, having a drunken feast, verse 7 tells us, drinking their wine to the full according to the king's commandment, According to the law, none did compel. The king wanted everybody to have according to every man's pleasure. They were just doing whatever they wanted, drinking as much as they cared to drink. And even Vashti the queen, in verse 9, is having a feast for the ladies in the, in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. There was a godly monarch, a godless monarch sitting on his throne as if he was the king of the universe. And who could argue? His kingdom stretched from India to Ethiopia. He had 127 provinces. He had riches, he had wealth, he had honor. He had a royal scepter where if you were just coming to his presence unannounced, you risked death unless he decided to be merciful to you. He had a royal signet where if he made a law, then there was nobody who was allowed to change it. He was on his throne, ruling over all as if he was God, as if there was no other God, no true God. But what he's about to find out as we study the book of Esther is that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. What he's about to find out is what Nebuchadnezzar found out, is that there is a God in heaven who changes the times and seasons and removes kings and sets up kings. What he's about to find out is that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now that reminds us of our society. Now we live in a God of the society, don't we? We live in a God of the society. Our government, our leaders, our monarchs, you could call them, they don't mention God. To me, it's especially heartbreaking as uh, we think of the events that happened at Africville just last week and how prayers are going out for that 17-year-old girl and our premier offers his thoughts. He offers his thoughts because thoughts do something. Where's the prayers? Why can't he pray for her? Why can't they acknowledge God and call on his name? Our society is a godless society where people have forgotten God, turned from God, as if God is not existent, as if God is not there. But that doesn't change the fact that God is still on the throne, that God is still ruling over all, that God hasn't abdicated, he hasn't resigned, he hasn't quit the job, he's still there, ruling over all. And the king's heart is still in the hand of the Lord, and he can still turn it whithersoever he will, whether they acknowledge him or not, whether they look to him or not. God is still God. He's still on the throne. 
There's a godless monarch, but God is still on the throne. Then we see, secondly, this evening, this godless monarch. Number two, he has godless morals. Godless morals. In verse 10, we read how on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abaktha, Zithar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of King of Ahasuerus, the king, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth and his anger burned within him. He had godless morals. You could say he had a godless mind. In these verses, we see the depravity of King Xerxes' soul. We see just how lost in sin he was. We're told in verse 9 that he had a wife by the name of Vashti. History names her something different, but it's believed that the Bible was not, the, not using her official name, but was using Vashti, which would have been a pet name. It just means beloved. It means a beautiful woman. It means a desired one. It's like he, was, he called her sweetheart. And uh, I need to remind myself, that is the name that my wife prefers to be called. She does not like turtle dove. She wants to be called sweetheart. But anyways, that was... Vashti, that's what it was. It was like calling her sweetheart. And uh, in verse 9, we read how she made a feast at the same time for the woman in the royal house. But in verse 10, we're told that it's the last day of the feast, the seventh day, and the heart of the king's merry with wine. He's drunk as a skunk. He's, uh, he has no control of his faculties. And he's giving in to the most base desires of his soul. So it was that when he was filled with wine that he commanded these seven chamberlains to bring his beloved one, his beautiful wife, his, be his desired one, his best, Vashti the queen, with the crown royal into the presence of the princes and people for her beauty, to see her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But in verse 12, Vashti refuses the king's invitation and some might say, well, with the king being who he was, and as unpredictable as he was, why didn't she just say yes? I mean, the king wants to show off his wife. It's not right to do it. He's a bit offensive to do it. But we all know his temperament. We all know how we react. So just put on your best gown and go to the ball with your husband and leave as fast as you can. Just go through it, you'd say. But the problem was, no doubt, that's not what he was asking for. In those days, I be it's believed it was a custom that they would parade them in front of them naked. And so Ahasuerus was, trying to, was wanting to really to humiliate his wife, to dishonor her by parading her in front of these strangers with no clothes on, something that was immoral, something that's a shame, something that was against a conscience that fears God, something that was completely wrong. And praise the Lord, Vashti had some character and she told her husband, no, she had some character. Yes, while the king was the king and had authority, while he's her husband and she's required to reverence her husband, that doesn't mean that you just go and sin against the Lord your God. And Vashti said no. And it was a day with godless morals. And you know, we live in a day with godless morals too. We live in a godless society with godless monarchs and godless morals. How many people have written books entitled, I never thought I'd see the day. I never thought I'd see the day. We live in a day where sin is paraded. We live in a day where man's morality is so low that a hazardous would fit right in with today's world. We live in a day when God, God is so far from people's mind that they have no conscience left to sear, nothing left to stop them from doing the most obscene things and even treating those they love the most the worst. And we need people like Vashi who are willing to say no to sin. We need people who are willing to stand up for what's right to, regardless of the consequences. People with integrity, people with godly morals, 
people who fear the Lord and keep his commandments. I wonder, are you one? Are you one who fears the Lord? The emphasis tonight is even in the day with godless morals, God is still on the throne. Here the kingdom is with a godless monarch who has godless morals. You think God's not there, but we're going to see in the book of Esther that God's still there. God is still over all. He's still on the throne. He's still working in the world of men. God is still on the throne in spite of the godless monarch with godless morals. And then as we look at the remainder of this chapter, we see this godless monarch and God, with godless morals gives a godless mandate. A godless mandate. Now, I can just imagine being being in that room and seeing the king's face after Vashti said no. There he is waiting for her to come and the chamberlains come back and say to the king that she has said no, that she has refused the royal command. And uh, this is the man who beat the sea, remember. Now, history-wise, it's between chapters 1 and 2, I believe, when he beats the sea. So he maybe hasn't done it yet. <laughs> but this is the kind of man who he is. And now his wife has told him no. And so what shall we do, he says to his seven princes, what shall we do to Vashti? Because she has not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. What shall we do unto her? And there's, there's a man there named Mamukan. I really think that's an unfortunate name. But anyways, Mamukin speaks up. He obviously is the chamberlain or the, the prince that is the spokesman for the other seven. And uh, he says in verse number 16, And Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall, all the, shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. Like there's going to be anarchy. All our wives are going to rebel against us because your wife has rebelled against you. We've got to do something. So verse 19, he says, If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that vast ye come no more before King Ahasuerus, and that the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. Now I actually think Vashti, I mean, considering who her husband was and the godless man that he was, she had it pretty good. Because not only was her life spared, but she didn't have to see him anymore. <laughs> and... I used to think that she maybe got sent far away, like banished out of the kingdom. I guess that would be beyond India or beyond Ethiopia, whatever way you're going. <laughs> but no, it, it, it's just that she doesn't come before him anymore. Most likely she remained in the palace. She would have remained in the house for the woman and she would have been taken care of the rest of her life, just not coming before the king anymore. And uh, But then the other part of the command is that Every man should bear rule in his own house. And uh, that's a good thing in that, well, that's biblical. The Bible speaks that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and gave himself for it. And you might read this and think, finally, a king that agrees with the scripture. Except the Bible gives the male authority, yes, but the husband's to love his wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And King Ahasuerus' beef with his wife is that she wouldn't humiliate herself for him like he commanded her to. And that's not what any husband is supposed to do. And so what this command really was, was that husbands could treat their wives however they wanted, and the law was on their side. It was a godless mandate. 
a godless law. Uh, he was sending throughout the whole land. I uh, was simply um, allowing men to run over their women, their wives, and treat them with such disrespect. And um, I was a godless decree. Sounds like God must be absent from this land. What's going on? But guess what? Even when a land with godless mandates, God is still on the throne. And we're going to see it in this, chat, in this book, that God is still ruling over all. And it's encouraging to us because, well, Persia is a lot like Halifax. It's a lot like Canada. The land that Esther lived in is a lot like the land that we live in today. We have godless monarchs with godless morals and godless mandates. But that doesn't mean that God isn't there, that God's not working, taking care of his people, still ruling in the world of men. The book of Esther declares that God is still on the throne. He providentially provides for his own. He foresees our needs and sees that it is met. As one has said, we'd be more grateful if we only knew how much of what we take for granted is arranged by God. I like that. Let me repeat that. We would be more grateful if we only knew how much of what we take for granted is arranged by God. There's a godless monarch that has godless morals, giving godless mandates, but God is still there. He's still on the throne. In the book of Esther, we see how God works. There was no miracle that they saw. They didn't see anybody healed or anybody raised from the dead or any sea parted or anything like that. They didn't have manna from heaven. But at just the right time, God manipulated the circumstances. God changed what was happening so that just when they needed it most, the deliverance came. As someone said, God is in this book of Esther, not in so many syllables, but in events, not in miraculous in interventions, but as guiding the wheels of providence, not in open communication, but as the unseen power overruling all. The book of Esther is the story of God's providence. What's providence? It's God acting anonymously. That's what one man said. Providence is God acting anonymously. And it should encourage Christians as we read the book in, of Esther to have an increased trust of God. Because we live in a world where sometimes you wonder, what's going on? Like Job, you say, where is God? But the book of Esther reminds us he's right where he's always been. He's still on his throne. He's still in control. It was Benjamin Franklin who said, the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. God is still on the throne. In fact, tonight we've seen the first step in preparing for the deliverance of God's people at a time of need. God's made it so that there's a place for Esther in the palace so that she now can come in and be the one that God puts there for such a time as this to deliver his people. God is on the throne. Do you trust your life to him? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your word tonight. Lord, it's so exciting to think of that truth, that God is still on the throne. We can trust him with our lives. And Lord, we look at the world and we see what, exactly what Esther saw, a godless monarch, a godless morals, godless mandates. God is not in all their thoughts, but Lord, you're still there. You're still over all, and we can still trust you. I pray, Lord, this morning that each, or this evening, that each one of us will put our trust in you. If there is someone here tonight that's not saved, I pray that won't be saved. I pray, Lord, that you use the time, Lord, to make us more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.